My name is uh, Tom Switzer, as you know, and I'm the Executive Director here at CIS, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to uh, the Centre for Independent Studies uh, membership drinks for our loyal warriors here at CIS. I hope you, I hope you like our card. If, if you remember, most of you should be aware of our card. It's actually drawn by one of our, uh, one of my favourite artists, Anton Emden, whom I used to commission to do cover artwork for The Spectator magazine, both in England and here in Australia. And Anton, I think, in many respects, reflects the spirit of the times, you know, with all this fretting and wailing about uh, trigger warnings. And here we have Santa Claus, or St Nicholas, Father Christmas, simply saying, ho, 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 Merry Christmas. And here we have these politically correct elves saying, either you can't say this or that's a... It's a macro, microaggression or I'm triggered or stop culturally appropriating, I'm going to my safe space. And in many respects, uh, that says it all about uh, the state of the political debate in many respects. And I think that somewhere, somewhere, our, our dear friend, uh, Bill Leak is smiling. <laughs> but this is no laughing matter. Um, one of our members who happens to be in academia in Canberra, I won't reveal too much about him, but he's a member and he received this card, and I'm not kidding you, he actually said to my colleague Jenny Lindsay that he loves the card but he can't showcase it at work lest his academic colleagues are outraged. <laughs> <laughs> and it reminded me of a time when I myself was in academia. I spent eight years at the University of Sydney and I enjoyed it immensely. I had eight wonderful years at the University of Sydney's US Study Centre. But I'll never forget an unseasonably warm winter day. It was in August of 2013. And my colleagues and I were talking about what a beautiful day it was. It was sun, sunny, uh, warm, relatively warm. And uh, I just joked. I said, geez, I'm starting to love this global warming. <laughs> well, you can just imagine my colleagues. They were absolutely outraged. And it just brings home a point that we've said time and again throughout this year that there are certain subjects that can't be openly discussed without inspiring mass hysteria. And climate change is one of them. Uh, identity politics is another. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with this show on the ABC called Q&A. <laughs> right, right. Well, I was actually... Uh, I know many people who despise the show and... Um, they nevertheless watch it every Monday night. <laughs> and uh, my old friend Mark Latham says it's become compulsory viewing for media masochists, a self-flagellation hour for political tragics. And I, <laughs> and I was the guinea pig uh, the other night. I was a Daniel in the Lions den again. And I somehow found myself in a controversy about immigration. And I was up against my old Labor mate, Dougie Cameron, who's a senator, Labor senator. Uh, Dougie happens to be from Scotland and he's an unashamed socialist and I was just making the point that socialism's having a bit of a revival in Britain right now with uh, Jeremy Corbyn and right not, what not and I simply said that uh, Dougie you'd, you'd probably be, feel very comfortable being back home with Jeremy Corbyn and somehow this got turned into a, an argument that I was saying go back from where you came from. <laughs> And, I'm serious. And before you know it, there's all these Twitter trials on my back, not that I do Twitter, saying that I was somehow not just a racist, but I was anti-Scott. <laughs> and, and my position was Dougie was being tough on Scotland. Um, no, sorry, he was tough on neoliberalism. He was blaming Tony Abbott and, and Joe Hockey for neoliberalism. And I just reminded him that the true intellectual and political architects of neoliberalism in this country were his former leaders, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, who deregulated the financial markets, slashed import tariffs, cut taxes, privatised Qantas, among other things. And uh, these are policies that we at CIS unashamedly supported. Um, but uh, Dougie, the, the jokes and all that was lost on Dougie. All this political correctness uh, brings to mind, and this gets back to the, the excellent cartoon that Anton drew for us, a, a war on Christmas. And it brings to mind an absolutely wonderful column that Charles Krauthammer wrote for the Washington Post about 15 years ago. Now, many of you may be familiar with Charles Krauthammer. Uh, he'd, he'd written a syndicated column in the Washington Post every Friday 
since 1985 until last year. Uh, he was 68, he fell ill and he died this year. Uh, but Krauthammer was a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist and um, every Friday in the Washington Post. And I know that the Liberty World is embracing the Jordan Petersons, and the David Rubens and uh, among other people, uh, the Lionel Shrivers and, and CIS will hope to bring have something to do with those people in the next year and beyond. But Krauthammer, for our purposes this evening, is worth contemplating because he wrote this wonderful column. And I just want to read some extracts from this column that he wrote 15 years ago. Some Americans get angry at parents who want to ban carols because they tremble that their kids might feel different and uncomfortable. Should they, God forbid, hear Christian music sung at their school. I feel pity. Ask Krauthammer, what kind of fragile religious identity have they bequeathed their children that it should be threatened by exposure to carols or Christmas cards? Krauthammer, who was Jewish, wrote, I'm struck by the fact that you almost never find Orthodox Jews complaining about a Christmas creche in the public square. That is because their children, steeped in the richness of their own religious tradition, know who they are and are not threatened by Christians celebra celebrating their religion in public. They are enlarged by it. According to Krauthammer, it is the more deracinated members of religious minorities brought up largely ignorant of their own traditions, whose religious identity is so tenuous that they feel the need to be constantly on guard against displays of other religions, and who think the solution to their predicament is to prevent the other guy from displaying his religion rather than learning a bit about their own. To insist that the overwhelming majority of this country stifles its religious impulses in public so that minorities can feel comfortable not only understandably enrages the majority but commits two sins. The first, for Krauthammer, is profound ungenerosity toward a majority of fellow citizens who have shown such generosity of spirit toward minority religions. The second, Krauthammer said, is the sin of incomprehension, a failure to appreciate the uniqueness of the communal American religious experience. And Krauthammer concluded, unlike, for example, the famously tolerant Ottoman Empire or the generally tolerant Europe of today, the United States does not merely allow minority religions to exist at its sufferance, it celebrates and welcomes and honours them. Now, that was Charles Krauthammer in 2004 in the Washington Post on the petty defensiveness of religious and anti-religious minorities. He was talking about America, but he could have easily been talking about our own country, a liberal, decent, tolerant country. Although Charles was married to an Australian, he never visited our shores. He'd been confined to a wheelchair since he had a swimming accident in his early 20s at Harvard University in the early 1970s. But I'll tell you this, that Krauthammer column, I think, says it all about religious freedom and in many respects about the classic liberal tradition that we here at CIS represents. We lost an intellectual icon this year in Charles Krauthammer, uh, but we at CIS will forever be championing that agenda. I want to pay a few respects and thanks to people uh, closely associated with the Centre for Independent Studies. I first of all want to thank our great chairman, Peter Mason. <laughs> Peter, Peter and our excellent board of directors, and I see a few of them here this evening. Nicholas Moore, I think I saw Alison Watkins, among others. Thank you so much for all your support. Uh, we wouldn't be here at Macquarie Street if it weren't for the leadership of Peter and his wonderful team, so thank you very much. I also want to thank my Staff, we have an outs absolutely outstanding staff at CIS. I especially want to note Simon Cowan, who couldn't be here this evening, but Simon is the intellectual brains be behind our research team, uh, and also Jenny Lindsay, who runs our office. 
Um, I also want to take this opportunity to pay special thanks to my PA, Jane. Jane, is um, she keeps me uh, on a leash and without her I'd be a miss and a mess. And I also want to pay special tribute to my predecessor, Greg Lindsay. Many of you know Greg. Greg set up the Centre for Independent Studies in 1976, which was a great year for liberty because it was the bicentennial of not only the Declaration of Independence, but Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. Take that one, Dougie Cameron. <laughs> but Greg, as many of you know, started CIS in his back shed and within 40 years he took CIS from a back shed to the heart of Macquarie Street. So Greg, thank you very much, mate. And finally, thanks to all of you, I mean, CIS, like many research organisations, think tanks that don't rely on tax dollars, we only thrive and survive because of the generosity of our members. Thank you all for being here this evening and thank you all for your support. It's very much appreciated. Now I'd like to call on my friend and colleague, uh, Stephen Schwartz. Stephen is a former vice chancellor at many universities across the world. Um, don't hold that against him. <laughs> He's also one of the quirkiest, wittiest and decent public intellectuals I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Schwartz. Thank you, Tom. Dear friends, it gives me great pleasure. Well, um, I shouldn't have started that way. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have used those words. Um, I, me I took a vow never to begin a speech by saying, it gives me great pleasure. <laughs> you see, it goes back to when I was a member of the debating team at the Marquis de Lafayette High School. Um, to practice debating, we used to write topics on slips of paper and drop them in a bin. Then you'd pull one out blindfolded and have to speak on whatever you happen to choose. It was my turn and I went to the bin, I picked it up, and my topic was sex. So I announced my topic, got in front of the audience and said, it gives me great pleasure. <laughs> and then I sat down again. <laughs> You're not gonna get away anywhere near as easily tonight though, I can tell you that. Because I have to tell you, sex is still very much on my mind. According to the New York Times and the London Telegraph and the Australian Broadcasting Company, not to mention the Sunshine Coast Daily, the world is in the midst of a sexual drought. Ladies and gentlemen, people are just not doing it. In the last 10 years, the frequency of sexual behavior in the UK went down 15%. And here in Australia, it's gone down close to 20%. In Japan, in Japan, 43% of people under the age of 34 are virgins. The Dutch put sex in all their shop windows only to see it vanish from their bedrooms. The Swedes are so worried that their Minister for Health has decided to initiate an official government inquiry. <laughs> all true folks, according to the Minister, Sweden's shrinking libido represents a serious political issue. The nanny state is definitely a lie. Now, fortunately for Sweden, another Swedish politician, a man by the name of Per Erik Musko, has come up with a solution, thank goodness. The government should legislate to subsidize sex. <laughs> yes, Workers who can't be bothered to have sex on their own time should be given an hour-long paid break from work every week to go home and have sex with their partner. Mr. Musco explains, sex, this is a quote, sex is a great form of exercise. Um, this is aerobic, I mean, I know that's aerobic, if you do it right. Has documented positive effects on well-being. Malin Hansen, a Swedish sexologist, is quoted saying that sex reduces stress, improves sleep, and strengthens immunity. Subsidized sex would make people healthier, happier, and apparently also more productive at work. Now, Mr. Musco admits that there may be one or two small problems with his proposal. For example, enforcement. You, know. <laughs> you could, for example, pretend to go home from work to have sex with your partner and then wind up playing a game of Scrabble, or go for a walk or something. 
even if the enforcement problem could be solved, and I thought maybe by subsidizing voyeurism. <laughs> think about it. You'll get it. Think of it. Um, but there are still some who object to the proposal. The, social, the, <clears throat> the so Swedish Socialist Party, try to say that fast. The Swedish Socialist Party is against the idea. They don't like it because they say it discriminates against anyone who can't find someone to have sex with them, <laughs> which is apparently a problem for their members. <laughs> yeah. But I have to tell you that even the proponents of this particular proposal are not entirely happy. One elderly gentleman, who's quoted in the press, elderly gentleman, said one hour is not nearly enough time to satisfy him <laughs> and his partner. Now, I'm not sure whether subsidized sex is going to catch on in Australia. But I would not rule it out, ladies and gentlemen. We're facing a global paternalistic tide. Very little is out of bounds. France has banned free refills of Coke, free refills of sugary drinks, which is probably why all those yellow jacket people are out on the street. <laughs> um, the UK has introduced a tax on them. And Scotland, we've heard a bit about Scotland today. Scotland, of all places, has introduced a minimum price for alcohol. Can you imagine? Happy hours are illegal everywhere in Finland. Now, what about Australia? Well, we're about to find out tonight, because tonight we present the Center for Independent Studies Nanny Award. The Nanny Award recognizes the most absurd, irrational, idiotic, moronic, farcical attempts <laughs> to mine the private business of citizens. Not as good as the Swedes, I have to say, but we're trying. Given that the government, the whole of the government, and lots of organizations are working for us, there is never any shortage of really good nominees for the nannies. And the judges have had to work very hard. They've, they've labored mightily, and they've managed to whittle down the list to three. And I'm now going to tell you the three finalists. Third place goes to Arwen Birch who is an environmental educator, and she wants to ban car advertising, motor car advertising. According to Arwen, car ads always show beautiful, cool, sexy people gliding along in really nice cars on totally empty roads with no one around. These ads lull gullible people into buying cars. <laughs> When they experience the congested reality of real life driving, they get angry and frustrated. And what do they do? They become road rage loonies. Just ban the ads, no more road rage. But that's not all. Car accidents cost the economy lots of money. Their fumes are lethal, and they make you fat and lazy. So if we ban car ads, says Miss Birch, no one will buy cars. If no one buys cars, we'll all be thinner and healthier because we'll be walking and riding a bike instead of driving a car. So for her deep insights into human behavior, Arwen Birch is the second runner-up for this year's nannies. Our first runner-up is the Blue Mountain City Council. <laughs> the Blue Mountain City Council wishes to limit playground safety fences. You probably haven't given a lot of thought to this matter, but <laughs> The council has published new guidelines regulating children's play. Did anyone here know that councils regulate children's play? Oh, I did not know that. According to the guidelines, I have to read them. Fencing a play space from the rest of an open space limits the scope and variety of children's play. It effectively cages play into a contained space, and this keeps kids from reaching their full creative potential. Got that? Now, in response to critics who say that councils should just let kids be kids and stop poking around in their business, the mayor has promised to review the proposals to ensure, I have to quote again, that they do what they are supposed to do. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to learn exactly what that might be. <laughs> in the meantime, the Blue Mountains Council can bask in the glory of coming second place in this year's nanny. <laughs> and now the winner. Okay by a huge vote, overwhelming vote. The judges of this year's Nanny Award, and there's a certificate, that's it, Nanny on the thing. Um, the judges have chosen Sausage Gate. <laughs> Sausage Gate is a nefarious plot to rob us of Australia's favorite snack, the venerable Aussie barbecued snag. 
New research from the George Institute for Global Health, Vic Health, that stands for Victoria, by the way, the Heart Foundation, has revealed that the humble snag, served on white bread, of course, layered with tomato sauce, contains 2.35 grams of salt. That's half your recommended daily salt intake. Clearly, something must be done. <laughs> According to Vic Health CEO Gerald Reckler, Gerald Rector, and I have to quote again, it shouldn't be left totally up to consumers to make choices. <laughs> Of course not. She wants companies to reduce the salt in their sausages to government-approved targets. She also suggests that maybe we should think about replacing sausages with veggie skewers. <laughs> Corn works very well, she says. Now, if all that was not enough, there's more. Bunnings, home of the sausage sizzle, has ordered that its snags be placed on top of the onions in the bun. <laughs> I will illustrate. Bun, onion, sausage, like that, and another bun on top. All right, why? Apparently, when placed on top of the sausages, the onions fall out of the bun, and they make the Bunnings car park into a slippery ice rink, <laughs> and the customers are sliding into Bunnings <laughs> on their back, like a lot of lathered, greasy hockey pucks, right, <laughs> in there. Now, the onion toppers are not happy, right? They insist that sausages must be on the bottom because, well, because that's how they like them, you know. <laughs> anyway, Bunnings also, of course, works in New Zealand. And when our current prime minister, his name is Mr. Morrison, um, <laughs> met the New Zealand counterpart, Jacinta Ardern, she brought up the Trans-Tasman Sausage Gate problem. She said there was no greater international issue facing the two leaders. I quote her. I think, I can't do her accent, I'm sorry. I, th <laughs> I, I think we should make a commitment, a joint commitment, that on our watches, the sausage sizzle should continue. And Mr. Morrison, you'll be happy to know, was quick to agree. He said, onions on top or underneath, however you like it. At last, real leadership in Australia. <laughs> it's, a, a, it's enough to make you want to vote again. So for the audacity to attack the beloved Aussie snag, this year's Nanny Award goes to the Sausage Gate Plotters, Vic Health, the George Institute, and the Hart Foundation, and for sheer zany silliness to Bunnings as well. <laughs> now, of course, we're right to laugh at these ludicrous ideas, but there is actually a dark side to paternalism. Taxes on alcohol, sugary drinks, and other so-called sins fall almost entirely on the poor. They force up prices. They encourage black markets. They create bureaucracy, which sucks and drains resources from where they could be more productive. Worst of all, they almost never work. And any state interventions hardly ever work. Study after study has found that health outcomes are about the same in countries that try to regulate citizens' diets as do those that don't bother. But don't despair. There are bright spots on the horizon. I'm here to tell you that Slovakian cyclists can now have a beer before they hop on their bikes and get on their way. <laughs> Finland has repealed its tax on chocolate ice cream. <laughs> Spain withdrew its sugar tax. And while we are suffering through sausage gate, it's instructive to examine what happened to kebab gate. Kebab gate was a plot by the socialists and greens in the European parliament to ban the Donna Kebab. Can you believe it? No wonder the Brits voted for Brexit. Who would blame them? <laughs> Headlines in the press were great. Is the Donna a goner? <laughs> for Pitta's sake was my favorite. <laughs> Produced a very strong backlash, particularly in Germany and the UK. And I'm delighted to tell you that the movement has been defeated. The European Donna Kebab has been saved. It lives on. And we can achieve similar victories here in Australia. We can save our barbecued sausages. All we have to do is to ridicule tyrants and meddlers and busybodies wherever we find them. Let's make 2019 the year that all the paternalistic busybodies start minding their own business and leave us to ours. Thank you. Now, I have one more task. Don't clap. Yeah, one more. 
this is Christmas time, and we are all here at the CIS. And I thought it might be appropriate to finish with a toast. And I didn't know what I was going to say until um, my good friend Tom started mouthing off about the Scots. And <laughs> my Scottish wife is sitting here staring at me. And, and so there are a number of wonderful Scottish toasts that we can offer. But here, the, I'll take my words from the Bard of Ayrshire, Rabbi Burns, say, here's to the smiles of the people we love. Here's to the friends ever faithful. Drink to the hearts so loving and true. And never may we be ungrateful. Here's to the CIS.